All right, students, for this doing history debate, we're going to talk about the regulation of industries. For our question focused document, we're going to look at this cartoon by Frank Bello titled The American Frankenstein. What do you see happening in this cartoon? Who's right here dressed in the striped pants and starred shirt? What is this monster? What does it appear to be? And what is it holding in its hand? Try and see if you can identify a problem that's happening in this cartoon similar to something that may be happening today. After you've done so, generate a question about it. All right. I'm going to start our research or contemporary policy debates. We're going to be talking about net neutrality. I'm not sure if you are aware of net neutrality, what it is, what it means, but a few years ago, it was an issue that students really were worked up about. Some of the times that was because they misunderstood what it meant, but just knowing that it was something that was in the news and on the minds of students. Our historic context the United States government first began to regulate industries in 1887 when they passed the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. This was the first federal attempt to regulate a whole industry. Many other agencies have since been created based on the design of the ICC, including the Federal Communications Commission, which is in charge of regulating Internet companies. Since the development of the Internet in the 1980s, Internet Service Providers, ISPs, have been the ones who connect most users to the Internet. For your purposes, this would be like Cox or AT&T. In 2005, the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, created principles that said all ISPs have to treat all websites the same, meaning they can't increase the performance of one's website, like Netflix, over others, like Hulu. So these principles were not binding like laws. It was just what they suggested should be done. So between 2005 and 2012, members of Congress tried to create legislation to protect net neutrality, but all of those efforts failed. In 2014, net neutrality rules were challenged in the court case Verizon Communications versus FCC. The court said that the way ISPs were classified as an industry meant the existing rules would not work for them. In 2015, the Obama administration changed the classification of ISPs to common carriers and created new net neutrality protections. In 2017, under the Trump administration, the FCC repealed the rules and in June 2018, net neutrality officially ended. So we are talking about internet service providers and something called net neutrality. You're going to open up this article. As you can tell, the title of the article FCC repeals net neutrality rules for internet providers. If they repeal something, it means they're getting rid of it. So you're going to listen to this article and try and find out what the FCC is repealing and why that matters. You're going to complete the following chart. In the first one, you're going to need to explain net neutrality. In the second, you're going to explain what the FCC just did in regards to net neutrality. On the left side, we need to figure out why some people support this policy solution. You're going to be looking for a quote from Chairman Pai, and he's going to tell you here 
What is responsible for the phenomenal development of the internet certainly wasn't heavy-handed government regulation. You need to explain what this means. Heavy-handed, we talk about this real quick. If some person is doing something that's heavy-handed, they're very controlling. So heavy-handed regulation are rules from the government that are being very controlling over whoever those rules are targeting. So why does Chairman Pai think the internet was a good thing? How did it become such a good thing? Was it because the government was telling it what to do? He said, there was no problem to solve. The internet wasn't broken in 2015. We were not living in some digital dystopia. It's time for us to bring faster, better, and cheaper internet access to all Americans. So why does Chairman Pai like the idea of getting rid of these rules for internet service providers? Now we need to find out why some people oppose this. We go back to the top. This paragraph here talking about net neutrality activists. However, been rallying widespread protests against the vote, saying the repeal will empower broadband companies to act as gatekeepers of the internet. For example, allowing them to prioritize their own video streaming services. This may be confusing for some of you. So the idea is if an ISP such as AT&T is able to work out a deal with Netflix where Netflix pays them for better service, that would mean Netflix is going to stream better than other services. Does this mean more people are going to purchase subscriptions for Netflix? Will they, so many people move to Netflix that it will heart it will hurt competition, especially if we were to compare competition not from an established group like Hulu, but maybe an upstart. Somebody has a good idea for a streaming service, but because they're a new company, they can't afford to pay these ISPs lots of money. So they won't be able to get the same service. This paragraph right here also explains that large tech companies such as Netflix, Google, and Facebook have long spoken in support of strict net neutrality rules. However, as they've grown in size, their advocacy, advocacy has become more muted, putting on the forefront smaller competitors like Etsy and Venmo, which argue that startups stand to lose the most on an internet that allows for special priority traffic deals. Small companies will theoretically lose out without net neutrality. So with what you know right now, do you support or oppose the FCC repealing net neutrality rules? This is basically a question of, do you believe the government has a responsibility to regulate and ensure fairness within the industry? Or is it not the government's place to tell these businesses how they should operate? If you think that it's not the government's place, you are going to support repealing the net neutrality rules. Okay, time to go back in time for part two. We're going to study Senate Bill 1532 to regulate commerce. We go to our webpage. So we're going to talk about a couple parts of Senate Bill 1532, and you're going to try and tell me what their impact will be. This act applies to any common carrier transporting passengers or property by railroad across state lines. All charges made for the transportation of passengers or property shall be reasonable and just. 
What does this mean? Oops. What does it mean for charges to be reasonable and just? Section 2 is going to tell us. Any carrier charging one person more than it charges another for the same service is guilty of unjust discrimination. The violator must pay the person discriminated against the difference in the price charged. So if I charge one customer $200 for a train ride to New York, and then the next person in line, I only charge 150 was that fair? Was that just? This would make that kind of behavior illegal. Section 3. Any carrier giving any advantage to any person, company, firm, or corporation, or locality shall pay damages to the person violated. This one right here is very important. The railroad companies can't make special deals with companies. That's what the advantage would be. Because that would not be just. It wouldn't be fair. Let's skip to section 8. But for the purpose of regulating commerce, the Interstate Commerce Commission is established. Three of the commissioners shall be experienced in railroad affairs, three learned in the law, and three experienced in commercial or agricultural business. No persons with relations to any railroad company is eligible to be a commissioner. Commissioners must take the constitutional oath and be sworn to the due and faithful performance of the duties thereof. What's important here is not only are we going to pass rules regulating the railroads, but we're going to create a group whose job is exclusively the regulation of those railroads. So we need to discuss our historic context. What was going on at the time that led to a debate over the regulation of railroads? While the government's decades of policies supporting the expansion of railroads has allowed the people of the country to move westward, some people grew unhappy about the practices of those railroads. All of those who move west to start a farm rely on the railroads to ship their crops to market. They had no choice but to pay the rate the railroads charge. In 1789, the U.S. Constitution was written, and the Commerce Clause gave Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several cases, states, where commerce means business. So the Constitution gives the government the power to regulate business. Skip to 1867. The Patrons of Husbandry, or the Grange, was founded. The Grange was a group dedicated to helping farmers both politically and socially. Farmers are obviously important members of our community. After all, they grow the food that we all need to survive. But traditionally, those farmers are not the most politically savvy. The laws affect them, but if they didn't know how to influence the laws, they're really at their mercy. Because of that, a group formed to help them. Starting in the 1870s, lawmakers started to advocate for regulating the railroads. George W. McRae's bill for a commission to regulate interstate commerce carried by railroads passes the House but the Senate took no action. In 1877, the Supreme Court case Munn v. Illinois upheld a 1871 Illinois law allowing the state to regulate prices charged by companies storing or transporting grain, saying states do have the power to regulate private companies. So Illinois had passed a law regulating the railroads, but does an Illinois law do any good for the people of Kansas? 1878, Judge John H. Reagan introduces a bill to regulate interstate commerce. No action was taken. 1880, introduced again. 1885, bill passes the House but not the Senate. 1886, Supreme Court case Wabash, St. Louis, and Pacific Railroad versus Illinois 
rules that states do not have the power to create laws regulating interstate railroads. So Illinois had passed another law, and the Supreme Court says, while you are able to regulate businesses within your own state, you don't have the ability to regulate businesses that cross state lines. 1886, Shelby M. Cullum from the Committee on Interstate Commerce introduced Senate Bill 1532 to regulate interstate commerce in the Senate. So, looking over this timeline, what kinds of things led to the government debating whether or not we should regulate the railroads? In Section 1, we're going to try and find out why people believe the government has a responsibility to regulate industries. This is Shelby, the one who introduced the bill. But we're going to read a speech by Thomas Palmer. Thomas Palmer uses a story in his speech to make his point. I think it's fairly interesting, so bear with me. I expect to give my vote to this bill because it is a move in the right direction and will lead to better legislation in the future. This effort recalls an oriental tale. Some fishermen caught a chest in their nets. A voice inside the chest said it was a dwarf who had wondrous powers, who had been imprisoned by a genie, and said if they released him, it would make them rich. They forced open the lid and a misshapen and weak creature came out. They provided him with everything to help him grow, and soon he towered above them. His behavior changed, and instead of being their servant, he proclaimed himself their master. Just looking at these first two paragraphs, the fishermen were told by this creature that if they helped it, it would help them. But what's the result of that? Soon it overpowered them. Why is this related to railroads? Palmer went on, Railways are important. The question is not how to cripple the railroads, but how to promote them, so they may serve the people rather than to rule over them. Today, half a dozen railroad owners on Wall Street dictate the profits or losses of men and communities throughout the land. The complaint of the people is of discrimination. Railroads are beneficent servants, but they must not become masters. The dwarf has grown large enough for us to impose restrictions upon him else the old fable will be illustrated in practical life. All the American citizens ask for is a fair chance, special privileges for none, equal rights for all. What points did Mr. Palmer make for regulating an industry here? He focused on the power of the railroads, how large they have grown. He talked about what role railroads should play in America, that they should be servants, not masters. And then this fair chance. Make sure that you summarize one of these ideas and they tell me why that idea from the past matters for today. Why would somebody in the past, speaking about railroads and regulating them, be related to today's debate over regulating the Internet? Think back at that time. Who did the railroads have an impact on? Pretty much everybody, whether or not it was because you were producing the goods shipped on the railroad, or you were buying the goods shipped on the railroad, in some way the railroads probably had an impact on you. How is that like ISPs? For our cartoon, our second document, 
we were going to look at this one. T. Worst drew a cartoon for the New York newspaper in 1873 titled The Farmer and the Railroad Monster, Which Will Win? Remember in the historic context, I told you that farmers who had moved out west were being forced to pay whatever prices the railroads were asking. How is the railroad depicted in this? And what is the railroad monster's body wrapped around? What building is this in the background? Is that the U.S. Capitol? What is the cartoonist trying to say the railroads have done to the U.S. government? And also the White House here. And if that's the case, should the farmer or the American citizen use the power of the nation to do what? Summarize the cartoon and then make the connection to today's debate over regulating the internet. So in section one, we found that people want to regulate industries because they think those industries should be serving the people of the United States. And they think the industries should not have too much power. In section two, we need to find out why people oppose government regulation of industries. We're going to read a speech by California Republican Senator and former president of the Central Pacific Railroad, Leland Stanford, in his speech to the Senate on Interstate Commerce. We have a bias question. Before being elected to Congress, Stanford had become president of the Central Pacific Railroad. This guy, Stanford, formerly didn't just work for the railroads, but he was a president of a railroad company. How might that lead to him having bias in a debate over whether or not railroad companies should be regulated? Let's see if in his speech he can give you any good reasons why the government should not be regulating railroads. Senator Stanford said, There is a great difference between the possession of a power and how that power is used. The Constitution gives Congress the power to regulate commerce between the states, but railroads have nothing to do with goods they are shipping, so regulating them has no relation to commerce between states. What do my state's rights friends say to the general government interfering and controlling their local institutions? Now then, if railroads are so beneficial to the public, shouldn't the investors be permitted to reap the rewards of their investments? Investors should not be discouraged by the fear of the value of their investment may be lessened by legislation. If railroads are so good, shouldn't the investors, the people who put their money into the company, be permitted to reap the rewards? What's the reward of investment in a company? If that company is successful, what do their investors make? Further, in all these efforts at regulation, I find no protection to the railroad companies, no guarantee against impairment of income. If legislation interferes to decrease income, it is taking their property. If the government tells a company that they can't charge certain amounts of, of money, is the government telling them that they can't make that money? And if the government is telling them that they can't make that money, is that the same thing as the government taking their property? If railroads are public benefits, why should they be made the objects of direct and injurious legislation? All will admit that no legitimate enterprises should be discouraged, particularly those that add most to the convenience and comfort of the people and to the wealth, strength, and dignity of that nation. What reasons did 
Mr. Stanford give us for why we should not be regulating the railroads? And how are those ideas related to the regulation of ISPs? If we today tell an internet service provider that they can't make special deals with Netflix, are we telling that ISP that they can't make extra money off of Netflix? Let's scroll down to the cartoon. Puck Magazine published a cartoon by Frederick Burr Opper titled The Good Monopoly Missionaries in the Wicked Island. What is a missionary? A missionary would be somebody who travels to different places to spread a religious message. Who are these missionaries? He called them monopoly missionaries. Remember that monopolies are large corporations that have complete control over an industry. So we have these different railroad owners who went to this wicked island. And what did they build on that island? What's in the background here? They built a railroad. Would it be likely that that railroad had been helpful to the people of the island? Did it enable them to transport goods further and faster than they ever had before? Did these missionaries, in bringing that railroad to the island, help them? The quote below says, After all we have done for them, brothers, they insist on having five-cent fares. Let us leave the cannibals to their fate. If these men brought to these people on the island something that helps them, is good for them, why do these people complain about it? What right do they have to tell them how to run their company when these people brought them the railroad? How might that be related to today's debate over regulating the internet? Internet companies bring us something that we all use on a well, nearly daily basis. Do we have any right to tell that company how to run their business? Some may argue not. All right. We are now ready for step 2C, choices and consequences. Right here, in 1887, Senate Bill 1532 was passed into law and became known as the Interstate Commerce Act. The act created the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC. The ICC, the act was the first attempt by the federal government to regulate a private industry. So what did the government decide to do? They decided to regulate railroads. Why do you think that was? The American citizens had said the railroads were not treating them fairly and asking the government to step in and do something about it. How might it look for the government to turn to those people who were complaining and say, it's not our place to regulate the internet, or sorry, the railroads? The ICC was abolished in 1995 and its responsibilities were given to the Surface Transportation Board. So what are the consequences of their decision to regulate the railroad? If they're able to regulate the railroad, did that mean that railroads had to start treating people fairly? Is that a positive consequence? All right. Let's compare and contrast the, first, the two debates. What is similar between the two policy debates? In both cases, we're debating what? The regulation of a industry? Should a company, a whole industry, be told how to run their businesses by the government? Who 
what industry was being debated regulating in the past. And who are we talking about regulating today? In the past it was the railroads, today it is who? Think about net neutrality. Almost finished. Time to create your policy advice. So you are going to be offering your expert advice on regulating internet service providers. Why is it important policymakers consider this idea? Why should they be worried about the regulation of ISPs? Time to create your thesis. After comparing the past policy debate with today's policy debate, I advise policymakers to support or oppose the FCC repealing net neutrality. If you support the FCC repealing net neutrality rules, it's probably because you don't think it's the government's place to tell these companies what they should be doing. If you oppose repealing getting rid of those rules, it's probably because you think the government can play a role in making sure Americans are all treated fairly. So go and get your historic evidence from above. Look at the guiding questions to help determine which sections documents will help your position. Section two, people opposed government regulation in section one, supported regulation. Which of those are you going to use below? Don't forget that there's extra credit at the very end. If you have any questions, let me know.